Welcome to the Cashflow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to the Cashflow Project. I'm your host, Duke Ong with Tri-City Equity Group. Today, we have Matt Christensen on the show. Matt is a commercial risk advisor with WA Group. With me is my co-host, Steve Firos. Hello, everyone. You guys are really going to enjoy today's show. Uh, Matt dives into uh, some specifics in terms of uh, policy coverages, insurance, uh, maybe some things that you haven't thought to ask before, kind of sharing, kind of lifts the curtain a little bit behind some of the uh, inside secrets in terms of insurance coverages that uh, maybe you didn't think about and maybe you should be asking about. Uh, so I think you guys are going to really enjoy today's show. So make sure you grab your pen and paper, take down some notes, uh, and yeah, start mining for gems. Matt is a commercial risk advisor with the WA Group based out of Minnesota. Matt is a licensed property and casualty insurance agent with a specialty focus in all things commercial property, including multifamily. Matt's a reading enthusiast, open-minded, and is a basketball nut. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Duke. All right. So yeah, we connected on LinkedIn a while back. Um, so can you take a few minutes to share your background and how you got started in insurance? Yeah, um, actually, I mentioned the basketball piece and kind of being a basketball nut. Um, um, I, I moved down to Rochester here in Minnesota, and I had been doing coaching and, and kind of a stopgap job, and I was just playing pickup basketball. And uh, who my, my boss now, um, we just started up a conversation, and it just kind of went from there. He talked about, hey, this is a good opportunity. You can really help people, great, great industry to be in. And it's a really, it's a team environment, the culture that we're in. And I literally knew zero about insurance or risk um, besides taking like one risk course in my graduate, graduate, uh, um, for my graduate classes and just jumped in and been, been learning ever since. So I've been with the agency about six years now. So what risks go overlooked that um, can stop cash flow when it comes to like multifamily investments? I'd say the biggest thing is risk assumption you know, so I'm okay with people assuming risk. I think people are usually surprised to hear that. They think like, oh, you just want to insure everything. Um, but knowing what risks you're assuming and, and understanding that's really the key. And so some ones that often get overlooked for property management companies are um, like third-party vendor relationships. So, you know, what you're doing with your maintenance, your IT contracts, lawn care. For me in Minnesota, it's, you know, it's, it's snow removal. Um you know, understanding what those contractual relationships look like and how those are set up are really important. And to do it, to, to do that risk transfer is free. You know, you're already doing contract agreements and if you're not, you should be. And so I'll give you an example. Imagine you got a, um, a lawn care guy on site. He's doing work and he hits somebody with his truck. Now, if it's a small thing, it probably just goes to their insurance. Bam, it's done, right? If that person gets seriously hurt or killed, everybody gets pulled in that lawsuit. The operator, the owner, um, property management company, everybody, right? The attorney brings in everybody. And how you structure those contracts with your, your third-party vendors really matters because you can make sure that they're responsible with their insurance first, and then they're responsible for defending you. And then it would come to you if it goes through their limits. Otherwise, if you don't set it up that way, it's uh, you know, you're, you're splitting the claim or possibly taking it all on and that's a, a risk I wouldn't want to have or have my, you know, the owners have to take on either. Yeah, um, that's a great point. We'll definitely have to look into that for our <laughs> business. <laughs> uh, the other one would just be um, not fully understanding how insurance policies respond, you know, and, and um, you know, whoever you choose, just making sure that you have something that's truly educating you and going through, you know, what your policies actually say and understanding it. it I was talking to somebody actually yesterday who just described it as a, you know, like an uncontrollable expense. And you, it, it can be easy, especially when you're in growth mode, just to look over it. But there's a lot of risk within those contracts and not knowing what they are. Um, you know, it can be, it can be really uh, devastating later. So what are the most important coverages to know or have as a operator? So I would say probably the most common misunderstanding, especially when you, when you take over a new building is understanding um, what your rebuild cost 
should be. And most people go, well, you know, the market value is only X, right? So why am I, why am I having to pay for more insurance than what the market value is? And just understanding that distinction between the market value and what it actually recost, you know, what, what it costs to rebuild that property is really important because if you have the loss and you don't have the dollars that to rebuild it, you're, you're stuck. Um, so getting a good analysis on that's really important. The other one you see get missed a lot is I, I don't know what it's like out uh, in your guys' neck of the woods, but uh, for construction, you know, how long is it actually going to take to rebuild your property? So if it goes down, so a lot of policies, they'll give you your lost business income, you know, business, business income loss, and they'll do it on like an actual loss uh, or a actual loss sustained basis, meaning whatever it is is whatever it is, but they'll only do it for 12 months. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can get that extended out to 18 months, 24 months, and make sure you have the cash flow, not just for when it's rebuilt, but also as you're bringing in, you know, those tenants back in and trying to fill it back up. So, you know, you don't want to get stuck with, hey, six months of not having a cash flow coming in that you were expecting because it's still being rebuilt or you're trying to get people in. We're actually uh, dealing with that ourselves in um, our Michigan portfolio. Uh, we have uh, an eight unit building that uh, had some historic floods recently. And uh, yeah, the whole first floor was flooded. So, you know, we're going through that whole process of uh, working with the adjuster and trying to, uh, you know, get that uh, up and running again. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, and a lot of the things we talk about are like low frequency, high severity situations, you know, so you just don't see them happen that often, but when they do, you just want to make sure it's done right. Um, another big one is what's called ordinance and law coverage. And I, I posted about this on my last LinkedIn post for our, for our challenge, but you know, imagine you got a building and 50% of it is uh, there's a fire and it's gone. Right. But you still have 50% standing there. Well, the insurance companies can deem that as only a 50% loss, right? So if it's a $10 million building, uh, you're only going to get 5 million bucks unless you have ordinance and law coverage covering that other side because the city is going to come in and say, you need to tear down the whole thing, right? So you want to have that coverage. That's like the the A or the one part to it. Um, The other ones are, well, what's it going to cost to demo that 5 million? You know, that's part of that part that's standing. You don't get that covered unless you have that as part of your ordinance and law coverage. And then the last one is, which I love, like the, I think the class A properties are super easy to insure, <laughs> to be honest, but the, those BC 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, those ones, I love those ones because um, the ordinance and law coverage is so important because of the code upgrades that you've been grandfathered in on that, you know, if there's a significant loss and you're, you got to put a new sprinkler system in, you got to do new elevator, you got to put in egress windows, uh, the regular insurance that you have is not going to cover that upgrade between what the loss was versus what you need to be. So it's really important to have that, the C coverage or, or three, just depending on what it's called for ordinance law, depending on your policy and making sure you have adequate limit there. Um, and I, I just had a loss where it was one unit. Um, there was a fire and they had to do egress windows and the cost for the upgrade. Cause it was like a, you know, a hundred year old building. The difference is like 42,000 bucks. Um, you know, just for one unit. So it's, it's one of those things that it costs a little bit to put it in place, but it's, you'd rather have that or at least understand you're taking on that risk if you're not doing it. Yeah, it makes sense. So what are things to consider when you're figuring out insurance costs, um, like for underwriting a deal versus what the seller's performa or seller's insurance costs would be? (laughs) Yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, the sellers are trying to make their, their, um, property look as attractive as possible. Um, and one of the things that happens, especially if, if the, if ownership has, the sellers have owned it for a while, it's possible that, you know, I talked about that market value versus a rebuild cost. It's possible that they don't have an adequate rebuild cost on there because they're just assuming some of the risk. They don't have loans or, you know, the, the finance requirements. And so, um, their premium might be less because they had, might have more or less building value than what you need. So really getting it, getting their policy and understanding, Hey, how, what did you actually insure it for? What's your rebuild costs? Um, that's one big part of it. And then the second piece, like what I was talking about with ordinance and law coverage and some of those, a lot of the lenders require those, you know, the, at least the sophisticated ones, the bigger Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Chase, um, they're going to require you to have a bunch of these things. 
Um, smaller lenders typically don't. Um, so just knowing that if you're working with some of the bigger players and what your financing obligations are for insurance, that's going to really dictate what type of coverage you have and how much premium is going to be tied to it. So it's, uh, it's not uncommon for it to, the premium to go up <laughs> as you're buying the new property just because of those, those factors. Got it. And um, for a company, how would you uh, advise as far as umbrella policies or, you know, that kind of stuff um, once the portfolio gets bigger and bigger? Yeah, good question. So, you know, you just want to, you want to increase your buying power, right? So you can do it a few different ways um, from just the underlying general liability limits. You can have one master policy that has all those locations listed on a policy, as long as there's some type of insurable interest between those entities that are listed. Um, typically that's like a 50% ownership. Sometimes you can convince insurance companies that the property management company can have it and that they are the insurable interest because if they have a loss of those properties, they're impacted. So having those all in one allows you to do something called blanketing. So with blanketing, you can take those property values and combine them all together into one big pot. So if you had one building that was 2 million bucks, another building that's 3 million bucks, and you blanket it together for 5 million. Well, now that's a total pot you get to draw upon for any one loss. So at that $2 million property, if it's 2.5 million bucks to actually rebuild it, you get to draw upon that five. If you just have indiv individual policies, you might just be isolated to the limit that you have. Um, for the umbrella portion, you can get master umbrellas that go over the top. Typically, you don't get that with the actual insurance company you place with the underlying, like the general liability property. They're specialty companies, and they can go over, you know, the whole portfolio, um, and you can get a, a much better deal that way. Yeah, that's something uh, we should consider as well as we grow our portfolio. So, what's one thing you believe to be true that a uh, few others believe to be true? I would say a couple things. One would be that your environment matters a lot more than your motivation and how you set up your environment. Um, I think there's a belief that if, you know, if you're just motivated enough, you'll get it done. And I, and I don't want to discourage motivation. Like I'm a very, uh, in, I, I like to think I'm a pretty enthusiastic, open-minded, positive person, you know, in that regard, but your environment matters, you know, and how you set up your environment and focusing more on that than just being, just being motivated. Um, if I had to use a really uh, simple analogy, it would be, you know, if you want to eat better, doesn't it make sense to leave fruit out on the table and put the candy out in the cupboard? Um, or do you put the candy out on the, uh, you know, out on the counter and the fruit in the, in the fridge? You know, what are you more likely to do? And so you might have the same level of motivation on what you want to get done of losing weight or getting in shape or eating better. But if you, you know, if you're not setting your environment to be successful, you know, it's, you're just making life really hard on yourself and it doesn't matter how motivated you are. <laughs> um, so same thing goes true on my side of the world with like risk, you know, um, you think of like employees, just make it easy for them to do the right thing and do the safe thing. Um, don't just trust that they're going to be motivated to do it. <laughs> it's the reason why they have safety guards on machines, right? Um, they just want to make sure that it's easy. The environment's set up that you just can't get hurt. I think the second thing would be I'm a big poker guy. I didn't put that in my bio, but I think there's a lot of ties between poker and business and being like a multifamily investor. You know, so I, did you guys ever play poker? You guys, are you yeah. kind of casual players at all? Or are you? I mean, casually. Like, can you bit. elaborate on that? Like, what, what do you mean? Um, so, you know, when you're really, really serious about poker, you're thinking, thinking of things like being process oriented over results oriented. So, you know, you could, you could make the right decision and get the wrong outcome, but you made the right decision and over time, it's the right thing to do. You know, just like you invested in a property, you decided it for X, Y, Z reason, and it didn't pan out the way you wanted. It didn't mean that you were wrong, you know, and taking more of a long-term view versus, and vice versa. You might've made a bad, <laughs> a bad decision that ended up working out for you, but repeated over time, it's not going to be the best thing for you. The other one's like bankroll management. You know, we we're talking yesterday in one of our calls with uh, just leaving enough money behind, you know, so for capital expenditures and stuff like that, <laughs> same thing was true in poker. You know, you have to be able to withstand the swings that happen in the variance. And if you don't have enough there, you're, you're going to make irrational decisions and, and let emotion get, 
<clears throat> get involved more than, you know, making rational decisions. I mean, same thing with risk tolerance and emotional control. Like once you're already in that process oriented, like I'm making the right decision um, versus I need this result to happen. You, you know, you just, you gain a lot more emotional control over situations. Thoughts on that so far? <laughs> I got a few other bullet points, but I'd love to hear your, uh, I guess your thoughts on that or if there's any crossover. I completely agree. I mean, that, that's kind of how we try to build our businesses through processes and systems and, you know, trying to document things and keeping everything organized and executing on those principles instead of, you know, just winging it. <laughs> sure. You know, and things like sunk costs versus opportunity costs, positive expected value, you know, so what are the decisions you're going to make today that are going to um, be exponential in the future? And then things like just reading people, you know, and reading situations and understanding what their viewpoint is and their perspective. So, which I just, I know it's not a multifamily investing, but I just bought a house <laughs> and uh, going through that process and negotiation with the seller who had been there 42 years, you know, you, it, it becomes less rational, right? And some things become more emotional and you're trying to put themselves in yourself in their position and their shoes and, and then trying to find a win-win. A yeah. I mean, empathy, right. That's like a key to good negotiations. For sure. For sure. I do have a, unless you guys are firing some other questions, I do have some other like coverage stuff that'd probably be helpful to people. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Please, please okay. share. Yeah. One big one is called um, hired and non-owned auto liability. And that I call that the milk run. So, you know, you might have employees or somebody, uh, a property manager, somebody on site that is running errands on your behalf with their, with their vehicle. Um, when they, when they hit somebody, when they're out and about doing that errand on your behalf and they hit somebody, if it's small fender bender, odds are it just goes to their insurance. No questions asked. Right. But again, they hit and kill somebody, seriously hurt somebody. The attorneys get involved and say, what were you doing? Well, I was running an errand on behalf of Duke's company. Right. Um, well, now you guys get dragged in the lawsuit. That's where that coverage responds for the liability that you might be responsible for. It's super cheap. Um, I don't let any in, any of my clients not have it, <laughs> even if they don't think they need it. It's like you, you just. It's one thing I I just absolutely insist on because, um, again, low risk but high, uh, low frequency but high severity. What's the name of that again? I, I I'm I'm gonna, I'm jotted it down as <laughs> milk run milk run coverage. Yeah, I, you yeah. Know. <laughs> I, I need some milk run coverage. What, what's the uh, What's the technical the technical it's name for that? Hired hired, and non owned. Uh, hired and non owned. Got it. Yeah. The other one too, if it's some, you know, some companies have their own autos, you know, their own auto fleet. It's just super important to have, uh, have the names match up. So you gotta make, you gotta make sure that the, um, the name on the title matches up with the insurance policy that you have. Uh, it's just super important because at the end of the day, the insurance company, if you don't have that match up, they can say, well, here's a legal entity on the vehicle and here's the legal entity we have on our policy. They don't match. I'm not responsible for this other legal entity. I don't care who is driving it. You know, so just making sure that those, those titling, the titling pieces always match up or you're setting up some kind of paper lease that says X, Y, Z company is responsible for the insurance on, on this vehicle. Um, that's another way around it sometimes too. Oh, co-insurance. You guys ever heard of co-insurance? Uh, sure. Please share. Yeah. Uh, so co-insurance is when you undervalue a building. So, you know, let's just say you insist it has to be at market value, right? And, and it, it actually costs a million bucks to, to rebuild. You know, that's what's, that's what the estimate is. And you decide, you know, I just want to insure it for 500,000. Well, the insurance companies take that into account because they know majority of the losses that are going to happen are going to be, they're not going to be all total losses, right? The majority are going to be less than that. So they want to account for that, that premium difference. Um, so they'll do what's called co-insurance and they'll put in like 80% or 90% co-insurance, which means it basically means it's like another deductible. You know, when a loss happens, they're going to take out that proportion of what you, what you did do versus what you should have done. And it's a, uh, you know, there's a formula behind it. I won't go into too much detail, but the biggest thing is just look out for co-insurance. And if you're not, if you don't have the building value where it should be, just kind of expect that you're going to get a portion back on that check when the claims that claim comes in that, you know, uh, takes that into account. So things that can make that go away are either getting to the rebuild to what it should be, or you can ask for something called agreed value um, or agreed amount that suspends the co-insurance. 
or just ask to have the co-insurance removed. That's a, that's another big one that, you know, people are surprised at the time of loss, you know, when, when that kicks in. That's good. These are some, there's some great, uh, you know, technical benefits. I mean, I'm sure the vast majority of us don't typically, you know, even operators, even for personal insurance. I mean, obviously this has a little bit more uh, application to, you know, on the business side. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, these, those are, those are great gems that, uh, that the, we, we typically wouldn't think of, you know, this is where we, we rely on experts, you know, industry experts such as yourself who are working in that industry to be able to, to kind of help, Hey, look out for these kind of things. Right. So that's great. Yeah. And if, and if you, uh, you know, it's a way to help vet the, you know, if you're working with property management companies too, you know, you just asking, Hey, what are the details besides just the numbers and just making sure that they're, they're, uh, they're understanding and explaining it to you. Um, you know, because like you said, you, you're not going to be the expert on it, but sometimes the lowest bid is the lowest bid for a reason. And, you know, just understanding that risk of, you know, what are the differences between them? That's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, uh, question, Matt, uh, you know, kind of all with all of this craziness that's been happening lately, you know, have you seen any insurance claims come in or any issues like specifically maybe that you hadn't seen before due to all of this COVID? I'm just going to start calling it COVID craziness. Like I feel like I'm going to coin the term, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's made some changes uh, to the way people are behaving. So, yeah. Yeah, have you seen have is anything, you know, like, man, I've never seen that before. I've never had that question asked before or, you know, anything that jumped out to you kind of during during all of this. Yeah, I think I think the question that a lot of people have had is, you know, will my business income loss coverage, you know, will that kick in? Mm-hmm. And the the long story short is probably not. <laughs> you know, don't count on it. Um, there's a lot of exclusions and policies that's that take into account viruses and essentially they're not going to cover pandemics. But the, what I do encourage clients to do is, well, the second piece of that is, you know, can a, a virus like COVID actually cause physical damage to something, you know, to property? Cause that's the trigger on the business income loss, just like a fire happens, right? The fire caused physical damage. Now you have a business income loss. The same thing is true of, did it actually cause a, uh, a covered cause of loss did it cause damage to physical property so that's being that's kind of being sorted out in the courts right now in case, court cases stuff like that i've just told clients at the end of the day i don't make the determination of coverage for you the insurance company does so you know if i were in your shoes and you feel like you were negatively impacted by it i would i would turn it in fully expecting it's going to get denied but there's there's two reasons one is I don't want to stand in the way of a yes, no, because I don't make the determination of coverage. The insurance company does. Um, the second one is if for whatever reason, the government steps in and says, you know, insurance companies, you have to pay, even though there's exclusions in the policies, you know, whatever it is, I would rather be at the front of the line. I've already been denied of what the pot, you know, what you're asking for coverage on. And so if that, comes true, you're already at the front of the line because you can you imagine it's kind of like unemployment, you know, trying everybody trying to, to flood in at the exact same time if that ever happened. You know, it could be months or years before you even get a, um, a payout just because of the huge backlog. So I'd rather be at the front of the line having the claim denied um, than being in the back of the line with everybody else. Uh, but also trying to maintain that expectation of it's not going to be covered. <laughs> There's a very, very strong <laughs> chance it's not going to be covered. Hold your, you know, don't hold your breath. But that's let let the insurance company tell you that, and then and then go from there. So when in doubt, apply. Yes, yes, <laughs> you got it. You got it. So. <laughs> now, kind of uh, also to touch on on this, um, obviously, like that, you know, th- this is unprecedented waters. I think for for most companies, most businesses, and that goes for insurance uh, as well. Um, what type of industry changes do you see that could actually stem from? you know, all of this. Yeah, we're actually already starting to see some. Um, one is a coverage called employment practices liability. Employment practices liability has a few facets to it, but what, what most people know it as is, you know, my employees, if there's some form of discrimination against them, that they have a recourse to come after and, and sue the employer, essentially, and it provides coverage. And I, where I see that coming into play is, you know, just around my health information got revealed. Right. Or my, uh, I was discriminated against because of X, Y, Z related to being sick or, or in, you know, think of face masks, right. All the ADA compliance stuff of, you know, 
do you, can you force anybody to wear it? Can you not? Um, can they have an ADA, you know, uh, type of accommodation to not wearing it? You know, just tons of gray area that we don't have to go down the rabbit hole on that side, but it, it's just coming. And employers are going to, I really empathize because they're going to be put in really tough spots in those situations. And they could be doing the right thing, but still get sued. <laughs> And uh, that employment practices liability is designed to kick in for those type of situations. So we're seeing the market respond by saying, instead of year long policies, they're doing six month policies to kind of, mm. you know, um, not go that far out in the future and be able to give themselves more wiggle room. Um, we're just starting to see more exclusions and restrictions on the policy. We're seeing pricing going up. Um, same thing in the umbrella portion. We're seeing umbrella, the umbrella market kind of go a little bit crazy. Um, cause they're going to get touched. So they feel like they're going to get touched on, um, some liability claims, um, work comp workers' compensation is the other one, you know, a tough spot, tough spot to, you know, you're bringing employees back and, you know, are you going to be held responsible if they get sick, you know, or not for putting them that, putting them in that environment? Um, you know, I, I don't have the answer to that, but I, you know, it could be something that falls under workers' compensation, and I think insurance companies are going to respond, and I think premiums will go up, especially with work, work comp being so dirt cheap, you know, the last few years. I, I think there'll be a, a correction on that side. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And I could, I, could, I could see, you know, the, gosh, how, how um, legal, I guess, our society has been. I, I can't imagine the, the job in front of, you know, the lawyers, even sorting through kind of all of this, and especially on the insurance side right? Because you guys had, well, maybe not you specifically, but your t the teams behind you and all of that have to kind of sort through, hey, you know what, uh, the, the legal aspects and ramifications of all of this and the coverages and hey, is this enforceable? Hey, do you know, can we can we claim on this and, and all that? There's just so much to go through. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think I'd want to be on that side, although <laughs> it's job stability, I suppose, for, <laughs> for the foreseeable well, future, right? Like, <laughs> well, the other one too, the other one too, and this isn't a coverage that you often, for those that are kind of up and coming, you know, and starting, they, they usually don't get offered this or it's not thought about quite a bit, but I would strongly encourage it. It's called tenant discrimination mm -hmm. coverage. Um, so there's property managers, errors and emissions, and then tenant discrimination, they usually come as a package together. And sometimes you can get that employment practices liability, otherwise known as EPL. You usually get those all three bundled together, or at least those first two together. And that's, you know, it's the same kind of thing. My tenants feel discriminated against in XYZ reason for, um, you know, their, their health information got revealed or their, um, I was discriminated against because of my race or gender. I just think it's coming. <laughs> uh, I definitely think more of those, more of those are coming as, especially the more employees you have, um, you know, imagine the situation, somebody's sick in unit B, right? In unit two B and they find out about it. Um, you know, can you really count on everybody and on keeping their discretion and not, not outing that person of two B that they're sick, you know, and, yeah, it's, I think it's just going to be a tough, tough spot. And you're also balancing that with the responsibility to the other tenants of, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, trying to be transparent, but at the same time, how much can you reveal or not? So again, good attorney questions, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, you right. can, what you can and can't do, but the gray area is there. And, um, you know, that's where some of that insurance products can fill in, fill in the gap and help out a little bit. It was allergies. It was allergies. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, you don't even feel like you can sneeze or cough in public anymore, right? <laughs> don't look at me. Just don't don't even look at me. <laughs> we'll shift to the uh, fire round now. So, um, what is the best business book that you recommend? Probably, I like um, Tim Ferriss's Tools of Titans, mm -hmm. um, just because it's really digestible. You know, it's something you can always just go back to, just the format of it, and there's just so many little good nuggets of information kind of the coffee table style reading and you can pick it up at any point and you can just digest it pretty quickly. And there's just so many good little pieces of insight in there to, to take away. Um, the other one I just read uh, atomic habits. That one's really good too. Just about, you know, why do people not stick with actually doing the things that say they want to do, you know, and it really, it really dives down into that and gives some practical advice and, um, and for business owners, you know, that consistency piece is, is just so key in the right habits. So it's definitely a book that I'd recommend uh, others take a look at. Awesome. Yeah. I'm a huge Tim Ferriss fan as well. Um, what is your superpower? Oh, my superpower. 
That's a pretty good one. I'd say I, for me, the superpower is probably just being goofy. You know, I, 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 I take my, I, I, I don't take myself too seriously, but I take what I do seriously. You know, so, um, you know, just putting people at ease, having a good time and relaxing, but you know, there's, when it comes to business stuff, you can be serious and that kind of thing, but I don't know, just putting people at ease, uh, just having fun. <laughs> I know it's much, I thought you were going to say, a, I know that's not much of a superpower, but <laughs> I thought you were going to say a vicious crossover. No, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like, I like that better. I might go with that. <laughs> So uh, what advice would you give a passive investor looking to achieve financial freedom? I mean, I, to me, it's just, uh, well, actually I was talking about this yesterday with somebody from our, from our group, um, Duke, just who, who wants to kind of get, get in, but hasn't quite dipped the toe in. Um, just ask the shadow, you know, shadow a deal. Um, I, and, and be vulnerable, you know, just ask, ask somebody like, Hey, somebody that you trust or maybe been following in a while, I'd love to be a fly on the wall and be part of the deal. Um, I'm new to this. I just want to learn and be a sponge. And if I can take anything off your plate of the crap you don't want to do, um, you know, I, I can, I can help out and try and align up those skills. And I, my goal is just to learn. Um, so I, I think that's a way that you can be part of the process. And I, I think most people are willing to be open-minded about that. Most people want to, you know, show off the things that they can do and they don't mind, uh, you know, mind, telling it especially if they're not part of the deal now there's always gonna be people that don't want to do it but i don't know i just genuinely believe that people want to help other people and if you're just vulnerable and ask most people will say okay <laughs> especially if you're willing to do some kind of value exchange of doing some crappy part of you know i don't know excel spreadsheets or something that they don't want to do you know and, and taking that off their plate so that'd probably be my advice if, for those that are kind of thinking about dipping their toe and just to shadow something and learn um, without having to put the risk in yeah, that's great advice. Um, do you have any requests for our audience? I'd say just take your insurance seriously. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know it can be super boring. Um, you know, it's not the, the most fun thing to, to jump into, but it can be really life-changing. Get somebody that's going to challenge you, um, challenge your ideas, and, and embrace that. You know, somebody's truly going to advise you on things. If, if it's somebody that's just bringing the bid to you, you know, and just bringing the number, I'd be a little cautious about that or at least ask them to explain or you know, what are my options or you know, just explain things to you. So from the audience perspective, whether, whether it's me, I'd love an opportunity to talk to you and advise you. And if, if I can put you in a better place, even with the, if it's not me, I'd love to have a conversation to help you. Um, if, if it's with me, that's great. But otherwise, you know, just, just challenge people a little bit more. You know, challenge, challenge your advisors to bring more value and, and uh, think about things a different way and help you make good decisions. Got it. So how can people reach out to you? Um, so you can reach out to me through email, um, M Christensen. It's a not, nice mouthful. Uh, C-H- M-C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N-S-E-N um, at WALiveBig.com. So maybe Duke, I can do something through you and, and put something out there. Um, otherwise, you can call me 507-993-3085. So I'm, I'm here. I'm, you can reach me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn messaging is pretty easy too. Uh, I'm a pretty open book. I'll answer the phone just about any time of day, as long as my kids aren't, you know, screaming at me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just here to help. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Wow, awesome. What a great show with Matt Christensen uh, with the WA Group. Uh, you really shared some some great nuggets of insurance gold uh, with us. A lot of very specific uh, questions that. Uh, that we may not even have thought to ask, Matt was uh, making sure to, to bring up with us. So some of the things that we that was that I took away personally from the call were uh, to make sure, specifically in terms for uh, syndicators or other operators out there, or even just an individual, when you're taking over a multifamily property, one thing you want to dive into is maybe the third maintenance, third party maintenance contracts, things that you may be not um, traditionally think of, could it be a, a landscaper or utilities contracts, uh, basically just contractual relations. Those are going to be really important. So make sure you're diving into those and, um, and how those may impact your acquisition of the property. Something else he shared with us was making sure that you understand your policies, the coverages that are there, very important, and they may not cover exactly what you're thinking about. So he made sure to, to, uh, to talk about, expound a little bit on what the value of your insurance policy may cover 
uh, this a lot of, uh, and we ran into this with our own uh, acquisition, the insurance policy that was covering uh, one of the properties uh, was not up to snuff with what it should be. So when you dig a little bit deeper, oh, you can say, oh yeah, we've got insurance on the property. But when you actually go in and dive into the actual coverage of the property uh, and what the, the policy actually does include, it's not up to par. So making sure that you're, you're understanding the policies, uh, super huge. Um, something else you mentioned too was the uh, rebuild costs uh, and not only the rebuild costs. So again, we're talking about specifics in terms of insurance coverage, but also the rebuild time. So we're going to be, uh, if you're in an Im area that's impacted by, uh, uh, you know, a high number of uh, building projects or a, a lot of work, maybe due to a natural disaster, like what we experienced recently with one of our properties in Michigan, there could be labors in high demand. And so that can really slow down your construction time. So making sure that you have insurance coverage enough to go beyond whatever you're projecting could be really, really substantial. So making sure that that's, that, uh, that part of your policy is really key. Uh, another, another nugget that I grabbed was making sure or looking into what your uh, business interruption insurance may cover. I know that's affecting a lot of people right now. I mean, we have a lot of questions regarding the, like, hey, do I have any type of pandemic insurance, act of God uh, policy, uh, you know, riders or anything like that that can cover coronavirus or, uh, and, and really just understanding uh, the business interruption insurance, uh, what it does and does not cover. So again, just diving into your insurance policies uh, and making sure that you've, you know, not only that you have them on hand, but that you've got uh, a, a good understanding of what you actually do have um, is, is going to be vital. Um, and then one last gem that I'll share is uh, that, that Matt shared. And again, he's got a bunch. So make sure that you're listening to the episode. Go back and, and, uh, and take notes and, and dive into to some of the gems that he did share. Um, is the, uh, he, he mentioned ordinance uh, law and ordinance and law coverage. So uh, this is in the event that you have a loss of one of your buildings uh, or property. Uh, maybe you had, it's an older property and things weren't quite up to code, but it's grandfathered in. And so anytime, of course, you're going to make uh, modifications to the property is going to need to be brought up to code. Uh, and I run into this a lot out in the field for my end of uh, building inspections, property inspections. Um, so making sure that the coverage, uh, your policy coverage will include bringing the property up to meet code uh, and those additional upgrades is going to be key. So make sure you understand that. So again, lots of great nuggets. Make sure you listen, you guys are listening to the episodes um, and really diving in. So it's great, great stuff. And if you found value in this podcast, please subscribe so you can get the latest episodes. We would love it if you give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. If you know anyone who might resonate with today's podcast, please share the episode with them. And to connect with like-minded investors, join our Facebook group, Honolulu Multifamily and more. If you're interested in connecting with us, go to tricityequity.com to learn more. See you next time.